Good afternoon. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we welcome you to the event, The Changing Nature of Work and Capitalism, a conversation between IDB President Luis Alberto Moreno and Salesforce Chair and CEO Mark Vignot. The event will be in English with interpretation into Spanish. Para escuchar el evento en español, haga clic en el icono del mundo que encontrará en la parte baja de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma. Please send your questions to paulc at iadb.org. President Moreno, please go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, my good friend, Mark Benioff, who is the chair and, and CEO and founder of Salesforce and a pioneer, a true pioneer on, on, on cloud computing. Under his leadership, uh, Salesforce has become the world's leading provider of CRM, as we like to call it, which is basically customer relationship, relationship management uh, software, which is one of the most critical tools uh, in today's digital revolution. Uh, he's been named the innovator of the decade by Forbes and has been widely recognized uh, for his leadership on equality and stakeholder capitalism. And we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. He's always been very vocal about those very issues. Uh, he's equally the chair of the World Economics Forum uh, Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which basically is in San Francisco. Uh, let me just say that Salesforce is a, a key part of IDB's digital transformation, and it helps us not, and enable us to consolidate all our interactions with both our clients, our stakeholders, and more importantly, to better anticipate needs. That system has allowed us to create products that are tailored to our clients in looking at their realities, in learning from the opportunities that we're working, and more importantly, to strengthen our overall cooperation in many different areas. To the, we will be, by the end of the year, every office of the IDB across Latin America, our total of 26 offices will be uh, with over 600 subscribers already working uh, with CRM. And it has also allowed us to integrate all of our marketing, our communication, and our dissemination efforts so that both governments and the data and the policy advice they want from us can be quickly uh, anticipated. So with that, let me start the conversation and again, welcome you, Mark. And why don't you just give us an overview of how you see the world right now uh, and how are you thinking uh, of the many changes that all of us are going through as a result of the uh, COVID-19, Mark? Well, uh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to uh, see you, President Moreno, and um, it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. I, um, you know, this has been such a challenging time. Um, it's probably the most challenging time I've been through as a leader in the last uh, four or five months. And um, I, as I talk to different leaders around the world, um, they, they, very much say the same thing to me. I, I would say that um, uh, you know, of course, we started. This was a this was a, just a, something unbelievable. This pandemic. Um, then we moved into an economic crisis. Uh, we moved into a, 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 a social and racial crisis. Um, we have a global leadership crisis, and all of these things are happening simultaneously. And for leaders um, like the ones who are joining us on the program today and for all of us, you know, this has um, been a very difficult moment because we've had to really look, how do we um, succeed through something like this? Of course, we are in an empathy first environment. We, first of all, can only, um, fully appreciate the tremendous suffering that everybody is going through. It's just unbelievable. And, um, and what can we do to help uh, relieve that suffering? And also, at the same time, how are we moving forward? How are we, move, how are we pro progressing? And so I think this is the, the challenge that we're dealing with. Um, we, uh, you know, um, really, uh, have to reconceptualize, you know, the world that we're living in. The business plan that I wrote for my own company, for example, um, 
at the end of last year, in November of last year, I've fully thrown that away and I've written a new business plan. But to the same point, it's almost like the, bit, the whole plan for the world um, that all companies have written and countries have written and individuals have written for their lives and their plans and their programs. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're running a company or you're planning a wedding. Um, you're, you've thrown away your plans and you're coming up with a new plan. So we are, we're in a moment in time when, you know, we have to be empathy first. We have to really appreciate, we're all going through tremendous suffering. We're grieving a past that is now gone and we're entering a door to a new future. And uh, that's how I feel. I feel that I'm coming into a new future and I'm trying to look at how can I help others who are going through so much, so many problems right now and so many issues that are, by the way, it's, we're still in the very much in the middle of it. You know, I'd say, as I listen to you, Mark, clearly, uh, and you point out to, to the, you know, this crisis has put a light on, on all the enormous societal differences that we have and all the points that you just raised. And, and clearly we are in the midst of, of the pandemic still. Uh, I, when I look at countries in Latin America, we're now over 2.1 million cases. Uh, we, we're getting close to about 100,000 deaths and, the, you know, the, the numbers continue to increase. But as you think of the recovery, which is really the most important part, how do you see the recovery taking place? Where are the misperceptions that people see? Uh, when you think about growth, what things do you think are going to be critical for growth? Uh, certainly governments are back in the sense that, you know, the, the size of governments are going to be much bigger as a result of all this huge fiscal stimulus. So from your perspective, and especially from, from the digital perspective, how do you see that, that recovery taking place? Well, I think the first, you know, kind of our own story is, first, we we're in tremendous crisis. And when we looked at the crisis that we're in, we really looked at, uh, you know, on a few dimensions. First of all, of course, for our employees, how do we help them, our customers, our partners, and then our, our community. And I think that, you know, for the last 90 days, what we've mostly been doing is trying to stabilize how our employees are doing, stabilize our customers. We've done more than 10,000 emergency implementations of Salesforce. I would say the other key thing that we've done is we've been doing a lot of outreach to the community as well. We've delivered more than 60 million pieces of PPE or personal protective equipment. Um, so those are all things that you know, we haven't done before. They're kind of new things. But as the door starts to close in the crisis, and I think this is where you're going with your question, a new door is starting to open. And we're starting to say, like, we're moving into a new normal. You know, we're still, the, the virus is still here. We're coexisting with the, the virus. We're moving maybe from a pandemic into an endemic situation. And now, uh, how do we continue to operate our business? Now, I, I will tell you that from our perspective at Salesforce, I, I've said this already, but our pipelines have never been stronger. P business is continuing. So that is a very important message, which is there is, you know, a tremendous amount of opportunity that actually is being generated by this crisis. That's a, that's a phrase many of us heard. Crisis is opportunity. So when you have this many things happening, this is also an opportunity to help people. This is an opportunity to also improve your business, but this is also an opportunity to build new products, to add new innovation, to create new ideas. And by the way, that's one of the reasons that we created a, a brand new product during this called work.com because we, I was talking to hundreds of CEOs all over the world. They're all trying to reopen safely, but to reopen safely, they have to do some new things, including they have to do um, workforce triage. So people are coming to work. We have to make sure that, that they don't have a temperature. We make sure that they have not had, you know, that they've had a negative PCR. We, we want to make sure that um, if they are sick, that we have the ability to do contact tracing or something as simple as shift scheduling is we're not going to bring everybody back to work at the same time. We're going to bring them back in shifts to reduce the risk associated with um, uh, returning to work. So all of those things together really require automation and technology. So we built work.com so we could really help our 
customers get back to work. The, the reason I mention it actually is because I think that many companies actually have a tremendous opportunity to build new products, to innovate, and to help others through this crisis, that there is tremendous opportunity that can be unlocked inside the crisis for many organizations. That you actually have to think of it that way because you know, people keep asking me this question I get on programs like we're on right now, and the question will be, well, tell me, you know, uh, what does the future look like? And I'll say, well, it looks a lot like it does right now. I'm in my home, you're in your home. You know, we're, uh, all my employees are in their homes, all of your employees are in their homes, and, but we're still operating and we're still leading our lives and we still have our families and we're, but we're in a all digital work and live from anywhere environment. So everything has to shift then into that because this isn't just magically gonna go away. We're in the present moment. We're here. We have to realize the past is gone. You know, it's behind us. We have to grieve that past. We had a great life. We're getting on airplanes whenever we want to get to. We're try could come and see you in Washington, D.C. We're having dinner together. Maybe you're coming to Dreamforce to see me. It was great. But that's all behind us. You know, now we're in a new world. Here I am. I'm in a digital environment with you. We've never done a digital program together before. That, that's, that in itself is a message. But because it's new and because it's innovative and because it's the part of the next wave that we're in, we all need to think about what are the new things that we're gonna do. Now, I'll give you a couple more things that we've done. We're not just building new products. Like one of the things that we've experienced is that 36% of our employees, they've been experiencing mental health challenges. You know, being in the home environment is not easy. Working at home, it's not something that we're accustomed to. It's not something we know how to do. So for our employees, they have a lot of challenges. And so we started giving them daily coaching calls. Hey, you're at home, talk to us, how are you doing? You know, are you doing some mindfulness exercises? Are you paying attention to your breathing? Are you moving? Are you exercising? Are you taking care of yourself? You know, what is, what's happening with you? And then we started talking to our customers and telling them this story that, you know, we're tr actually having to do some personal development with our employees to get move them from what I call paralysis into participation. Because look, we, we want to we get everyone into this new environment and, and, and productive and successful and happy and feeling good. And, and so we have to move them from paralysis into participation. So we created this internal call called Salesforce Be Well. Well, all of a sudden, customers are saying, hey, can we listen in on that? Can we attend that? So many customers asked us about that. We did, you know what? We're just going to make that public. So almost every single day, we have a Salesforce Be Well call just to help our customers and our employees pay attention to your mental health. This is number one. Number two for us, we did was every Wednesday, I do an all hands call with my employees all over the world. I haven't done that since we're a startup. Now, you know, we're 21 years old. We're 52,000 employees. We'll do 20 billion in revenue this year. Salesforce is the number one customer provider uh, system in the world, you know, not only providing it for the IDB, but hundreds of thousands of companies all over the world. Well, guess what? You know, it's been a long time, I have to be honest with you, since I did an all hands call on a regular basis. It's what we used to do when we were a startup. But now every Wednesday, we're having to communicate to our customer, to our employees. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Because we're also in a world where not only have to take care of ourselves mentally, but we also need to over communicate. And this is like the second step for people to be successful in today's world. We need to over communicate. That's one of the reasons we're doing the program here. You know, this is like, I'll do, I do one of these, it feels like almost every day now. I was actually just on one receiving information. Now I'm on one giving information. This is, a, it, the velocity of information and communication is unbelievable, but we have to over communicate. We have to over communicate. So for me, that's very much step, you know, very much kind of step two. So from our, our employees and for our customers, we're also trying to over communicate. 
And then as we kind of move into the next stage, we think about what are the things that we're working to really help people with? And there, I, there's really a number of things that I think are extremely important. One is participation, like I mentioned. The second one is enablement. We need to train people, communicate. Here's how to be successful. Here's how to actually do a Zoom call, for example. Like, I don't know how many Zoom calls you hosted before, but you know, this, like we have to train our employees. We're, we want our employees to be able to do this with their customers as well. We also want something very important. We want them to be relevant. We want them to be relevant, have a relevant message in today's world. And we want them to have, you know, actual actions that they can take to help their customers. These kinds of things, this kind of environment, this is not where we were just a few months ago. So this is quite significant. And I think all of us need to pivot our organizations into this so that we can be more successful in this environment. Now, I'll just tell you, by doing this, I've radically increased my pipelines. So I feel like I am getting back to high levels of productivity in my own organization. And that's why I'm communicating back. Here are the things that I've done that work. Focus on mental health, focus on over-communication, focus on participation, and focus on being relevant. So that's one of the reasons we want to build a product like work.com. And every company needs to build the product and innovation and technology to be relevant in this environment. That's why you're doing this seminar today as well. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gambit on relevancy. All of us have to do this. I, I hope that answers your question. Oh, no, this is great, Mark. And, and you're right in that, uh, you know, it's fascinating what you say of over communicating and equally kind of the anxiety and the mental health of our staff and, and everybody who, who is in, 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 in this enormous challenge that we're in. But yet, I find it certainly with my colleagues, uh, as in your case, you probably had, I don't know, 50 offices around the world. Now you have over 50,000, everybody working from home. Uh, in our case, it's about 3,000. But the question is, how is the future in terms of, eventually we'll return to the office. Uh, when you look forward, how are we going to cohabitate between people being in the office and some remaining at home and do you see these tools that we currently have be improving? Because one of the areas that we definitely always are going to miss is the personal contact, that relationship to look at somebody in the eye and, and be able to read their body language, something that you do very good in trying to, to capture people. How, how do you see that evolving? Well, isn't that a powerful thing? Because for people like you and I, especially, you know, we are people, people. We like to shake people's hands, give you a hug and a kiss, take you to dinner, talk about your family, a mesh with you, you know, ask you, how is your life going? How is your family going? I know your family members, you know, I know how important your family is to you. We work on the World Economic Forum together. We work on the IDB together. We're doing all these things. We like to go to these meetings. We go to customer sites. We're really working to help improve customers make them better and all of a sudden we can't we can't actually get on i can't actually get on an airplane and go anywhere there's nowhere for me to go where am i going to go most countries by the way as an american i'm currently persona non grata in almost every country you know because of the raging pandemic inside the united states almost every country has shut its doors on us and said not yet we're not ready for you in fact, there's only one region of the world, which is like a small island nation in the South Pacific that said, maybe in July, if you have a negative PCR test, we will let you in our country. Wow, that's amazing how different it was just, you know, when we were all together last in January. Well, we've got to think about kind of what I said before. We're now in an all digital world. Here we are. I'm digital right now. You're digital. Everyone's joining us in an all digital world and work and live anywhere. That is, I'll talk to people, they're walking down the street, they're doing their exercise, they're, that's our meeting, you know? I mean, they're at home, they're in their bedroom, you know, which is actually where I am right now. I just have this nice fancy backdrop on right now. But if I was to get rid of the fancy backdrop and say, you know, where am I right now? I'm, I'm not in any place fancy, I'm just in my, I'm just in my bedroom. That's all there is to it. You know, here I am, here it is, it's just a bedroom. 
But the digital magic is now I have a back background. So we need to like say, wow, things have really changed. Therefore, we need to change. Therefore, our companies need to change. Therefore, our products need to change. Therefore, how we interact with our families need to change. How we interact with our health, our pro every part of our life, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, we need to change. We need to ask ourselves, what do I really want right now? The world has changed. Boom. I need to let go of the past. It's gone. Like I said before, it's gone. Now I need to like get ready and go into the future, which is now and say, now how, what am I, what can I do to be successful? And as part of that, think, look at all the challenges that are in the world. Part of that success is going to be about giving and supporting others. That, that's going to be a critical part of what we're doing. So I think that this is a really important moment. You know, I think about, by the way, one of the things is we have, um, we now actually have quite a few offices reopen. So Tokyo, you know, Japan is open, Korea is open, Hong Kong is open, New Zealand is open, and Copenhagen is open. So that's exciting. Not that I can go there, but I'm happy that my employees have an office that they can go and visit and be there and work and so forth. And, you know, but the way they walk in every day is different. So they walk in, their temperature is taken. They're queued in the elevator the night before by an application, work.com. Only four or five of them are allowed in the elevator at one time. Can't have like 10 or 20 people in an elevator because you can't have that kind of you know, you need social distancing now in the elevator. Up they go in the elevator. They come into the office. The office has actually changed. Everything is spread out. Only half of them are allowed in at one time. There's plexiglass shields between all of our beautiful desks. We used to have just a beautiful desking environment. If you go on my Twitter feed, you'll see the pictures of the plexiglass shields that are now in place. They're wearing masks. Okay. And I don't have my mask with me, but you know what it, it is. Usually I'm wearing a mask if I'm in an external environment or I'm outside. And also they are um, operating differently inside. Usually they go into the kitchen, they're gonna grab a big handful of, of gummy bears. You know, there's no gummy bears in the kitchen because you can't have that kind of interaction. So um, there has to be shift scheduling. That is only half of them are in at one time. There has to be elevator queuing. Um, there has to be workforce triage. We have to know where they are. They can't go between floors. They have to stay on floor seven. They can't go to floor eight. The reason why is if, if the next day they get sick, which is possible, then we need to call everybody that they've been around or what we call contact tracing and say to them, uh, you know, you were with uh, Judy last night and she's sick today. So you're not coming in for the next 14 days. So you have to be ready for that. So all of those things, that is a different world for our employees today. So we are moving into a different world. So that needs to be a wake up call for all of us. How will we change? Because we're not going back to where we are. And I think in many situations, in many places in the world, this virus is becoming endemic, not pandemic, but it means it's, become, it's becoming present. And, um, so people are going to have to think about how do they do things a little bit differently than they did before. Mark, you've been a, a big proponent for a long time of uh, stakeholder capitalism. You, you've always stood up, uh, as, you, as many of the conversations we've had, uh, for things that Salesforce staff would want you to stand up to. And you've done it repeatedly on areas of you know, the poverty that you see around San Francisco and the many things you've been doing there. You did it with race and all the police brutality that we have seen recently. How do you see the evolution of businesses to deal with many of the challenges that you just talked about, where we're going to have to rethink totally how we work uh, as a business in terms of our responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis our stakeholders, our communities, our suppliers, and of course, our staff and, and the employees that work in companies. How do you see that evolving? Well, I'm so glad you asked me that question. I'll tell you that, you know, like I said earlier, crisis is opportunity. 
So now we know that we had challenges in the world other than this, but they were not prioritized. And, you know, business, I really believe, is one of the greatest platforms for change. And this is an opportunity now for us to show how business can add value. You know, for a long time, business was really dominated by the thinking of Milton Friedman. You know, he famously said, the role, the, the sole responsibility really of business is to increase profits. We know that. And then, of course, we know Professor Schwab, who's both, you know, a friend of both of ours. He laid out a rev, you know, revolutionary idea that business can kind of serve a broader set of stakeholders, stakeholder theory. He did that in the early 70s, that the business of business is to improve the state of the world. So for many business leaders, it's just a theory, even now. But, you know, I would even say some CEOs probably still reject it, that it's still all about the shareholder. Well, that's not how I view business. You know, I really look at that we need to be about stakeholders. Now, you know, look, last year, you know, even as we've had all this crisis, you know, our shares are still up, you know, 30, 30 something percent. So that, that's been amazing. You know, since becoming a public company in 2004, we've delivered a 3,400% return to our shareholders, you know, a, uh, market capitalization in the hundreds of billions of dollars. But at the same time, we hold ourselves accountable. As you know, we hold ourselves accountable for something greater, which is to a broader set of stakeholders, to customers, to employees, to partners, to com all of our, com our community, and, and yes, the planet as well. All of these are our key stakeholders. This is so important to us, you know, and by really guided by our core values, trust, customer success, innovation, the equality of human being, we recognize that business is this great platform for change. So, you know, right now, we are, we have this incredible global crisis. You know, when we were in, we, when we were together in January, we talked about it's a crisis of trust. Now we have more than a crisis of trust. We have a biological crisis, an economic crisis, you know, we have this, as I said, a racial injustice crisis. We have so many things that are happening. So we need to look now at each one of our key stakeholders and ask, you know, how, how do we move things forward? I mentioned how kinds of things I'm doing for my employees. I mentioned the kind of things I'm doing for my customers. I mentioned what are the kind of things I'm doing for my community? Each one of my stakeholders, and by the way, even our areas where, of course, Salesforce is already a net zero company, that's so important. I hope that every organization is focused on becoming a net zero organization. That is no net new carbon emissions. We issue our stakeholder report on a regular basis because the planet is a key stakeholder. Also in Davos, we introduced 1T.org, which is our trillion tree vision, which is to deliver a trillion new trees on the planet to sequester 200 gigatons of carbon. We think that that is so important. But all of that is really aligned around our vision of how do we take care of all stakeholders? And I'll tell you right now, I have to just come back and I say again, you know, what do I really want for each one of these key stakeholders because everything has changed. So I'm trying to, what is really important to me right now? How am I getting it? These are the questions I'm asking myself because the challenges for business leaders are to transcend the problems and turn those problems into opportunities. Mark, speaking of, of uh, you touched a little bit about the, the environment is something you've been very passionate about. Uh, definitely uh, not only on the initiative that, that uh, you know, you launched uh, in, in Davos this year of the, trillion trees, but equally what you've been doing with coral, what you've been doing in Hawaii. Uh, you know, in a way, you call this kind of like this pandemic moving into an endemic uh, situation, whereas, you know, climate change has been knocking on our door for a very long time, and yet somehow humanity, we don't seem to, to get it together. Do you see this uh, moment in which we're in? as a way to truly move forward. Clearly, I mean, already that just the lockdowns themselves have meant that, you know, the world is finally seeing a, a tremendous positive shock in this regard. But how do you see uh, this going forward? And tell us a little bit about your initiative of the Trillion Trees and how it's working, because 
you know, especially in this current moment. And more importantly, as we think of the global south, the whole question is going to be about jobs. And clearly planting trees is a way to develop, deliver more on jobs. And your digital tools can begin to show us how countries are proceeding on this and doing that carbon capture that you suggest. Well, I'm so glad you asked me that question because I, you know, I think there's many parts to it. But number one is, you're right. All of us can walk outside our home right now. It doesn't take a scientist and look outside. The sky is clear. The water is pure. We can see also all kinds of reports of this all over the world. You can see it on Twitter. You can see all, everyone is reporting, wow, just in months, the environment has this, you know, incredible health to it. Even satellite images that we've seen are incredible. The reduction of emissions, even like in my home, the amount of wildlife that has come back is kind of amazing. Or I've seen all kinds of animals that I have never seen before. And not just me, everyone that I speak to kind of reports the same thing. So I think that we can ask ourselves a question, what is the message in all of this? What is the message of this virus? You know, I'm not a spiritual leader. You know, I, I don't understand the spiritual message, but everyone keeps saying to me, there's a spiritual message. Or do you understand what the spiritual message is? And I like say to them, what is the spiritual message? I think the spiritual message very much is just look at reality, look at what has happened. This has given us an opportunity to be with our families, to recal recalibrate our lives, recalibrate our environment, look at where we are. And yes, yeah, some of the things that we know are important, like sequestering all the carbon that we put out there, like, the, like I mentioned, the ability to go and sequester 200 gigatons of carbon. That's so exciting. And you know, one of the roles that I've taken on in my own community is to uh, lead something called the Positive Change uh, Subcommittee for uh, Gavin Newsom, who's our governor in California. And he wants to come up with a number of things that are going to make the things better. And of course, we're doing things for children to make sure we can do distant learning so that all kids can learn in this environment. We also want to make sure that we're able to get people back employed, just like you said. And I think having a conservation corps or a peace corps, we've all know about those types of things, but why is it that our state can't employ those people to do things like exactly like what you said, which is to even plant trees. Let's take a huge goal and go and plant a huge number of trees. Um, let's do other things also, maintain the forests. let's make sure you know, we can educate people. We can do all kinds of things with a with this type of conservation core. There's so many things that you can uh, you can do. So this is a, a powerful moment, you know, for for all of us to look at what our reality is and how we're going to improve it. We got so many questions coming in, but certainly you have young kids, as I know. And I'm sure it's been really a, a big challenge watching how they, they, they try to, to stay connected, to look at education. And I know you for being somebody extremely creative. And it's always in moments like this that humanity is able to really create new things. We saw it in the Renaissance. We saw it through the more difficult periods of, of humanity is when there is always an explosion of creativity. When you look at your kids and you see, the, which I'm sure you're knowing you, you're probably trying to help them stay focused and everything, and you think about education, what do you think should be the new form of education as a result of this endemic, as you call it? Well, I, you know, first of all, my heart goes back to the kids who are not currently being provided with an education environment because this was not how we set it up. You know, I have done a massive amount of education philanthropy over the last 20 years, 30 years. I look at even Salesforce in our San Francisco and Oakland public schools, we've given almost $100 million in philanthropy to improve the educational environment. And we have seen incredible results in our test scores and attendance and our ability to make our local public schools better. But none of that money went for distant learning. We never, it wasn't even in our mind that there would be a pandemic was about to hit. I feel completely embarrassed that we didn't really say, let's take a percentage of that money and prepare, you know, for 
Zoom learning. You know, whoever knew there was going to be Zoom learning, where all the kids are going to be on Zoom and on classes with their teachers. The teachers certainly weren't prepared. They weren't, didn't, they don't have a whole set of knowledge about how to do provide distant learning. You know, it took us a whole generation of teachers just to get them to learn how to use computers. I remember still walking into classrooms and saying, we're here, we're going to give you a full package, technology, money, personal development. We're going to make, get this whole classroom, you know, into the modern age. That took a decade or more to make happen. Now, overnight, we're asking our public schools to be ready to do, you know, this distant learning to make sure that these homes are connected, that people have modern technology like the ones that we're doing, using right now to do this seminar. This is a huge amount of work that needs to happen right now. So that is very powerful that we have a huge philanthropic opportunity. We're about to make a huge philanthropic grant ourselves to San Francisco and Oakland and to others to, you know, to radically accelerate their ability to provide distant learning. It's, it has to include a full package, again, connectivity, technology, training, all of these things. And there's going to be a lot of hit and miss because we don't know the best and optimal way to teach kids in this environment. So this is something that is going to be extremely important for all of us uh, to focus on. There is a, a question from a, a government official in Latin America saying if you could elaborate about how uh, you're using Salesforce, uh, what have you learned in supporting the U.S. government that can equally be leveraged throughout Latin America? Well, I, I would say, you know, the single most important thing that we do, I mean, is that we're all about entrepreneurship and we're all about creating great entrepreneurs and motivating them to create great businesses and to inspire them and to do everything we can to help that those businesses move forward. You know, I'm an entrepreneur 21 years ago. You know, I started my company. I was able to kind of you know, uh, create value, find my way, a new technology model, the cloud, a new business model, subscription software. I added in a new stakeholder model, a new philanthropic model, the 111 model. We created Salesforce. I think that this is a great moment for entrepreneurs. You know, it's during times like this that great companies are created. Salesforce was actually created in the recession of 2000, 2001. That's when we were that's when we got going. This is, the, this is the moment when you can create value, you can create companies, create employment. Um, and this is, this is when I recommend everybody to take the risk, to take the challenge, to take the jump, become the entrepreneur that you want to be and create a new uh, environment. When I look at Latin America, it's a whole region of entrepreneurs. It's people who are passionate about creating things and doing things and doing new kinds of things. This is a great time to do it. And by the way, maybe you're going to be a social entrepreneur. Maybe you're going to work on the environment. Maybe you're going to become an educational entrepreneur. Maybe you're going to work on the education system like we just talked about. Maybe you'll be a technology entrepreneur. Maybe you're going to actually become a leader of the government. We all know that all of our governments are really kind of manifestations of the last generation of leadership. We need our new leaders to come forward. That's why I said, you know, one of, I think, the crises that we're going through globally right now is a leadership crisis. We need new leaders who understand all of the challenges we have, but also the opportunities to come forward and help, you know, lead, these, lead, lead our countries forward. Another question coming from the audience, which I'm sure you've thought a lot about this. In this new world that we are entering, where do you see digital currencies? Do you see that they're going to be... A, coming up even more? Uh, do you see a, a role for Salesforce into that? How do you see the evolution of, of, of digital currencies? Well, I mean, I think the digital currencies aren't going away. You know, they're tr a tremendous value store today. They, they may be a tremendous, you know, uh, scalable currency in the future. That's, I think, still yet to be seen. Still, the role of traditional currencies ha is very important, especially in today's world, we can see that in the stimuluses that are required to keep our economies going. Central banks are more important right now than ever to stabilize. We've seen all of the research that's come out in the last several weeks that the incredible amount of stimulus that 
has been applied in the United States over the last three or four months has been essential to maintaining the stability of our own environment. And I'm sure that that's true for many of your countries as well. And I'm sure that's how you're thinking about this too, that we have a critical moment that the traditional you know, model is still quite you know, uh, uh, essential to uh, keeping our businesses and economies moving forward. When, when you and I were in, in actually in, in Colony, uh, there was a number of times that we discussed universal basic income. And do you see that as something that the world over, especially for the poorest, is going to be something that is going to be central to this new reality that we have to live in and to create the kind of social cohesion that we need? Well, I think it's likely. I think we've already seen it in the United States as an example. We're giving everybody a universal basic income right now and have for the last several months. And as I just mentioned, it has been absolutely essential to keep people moving and to keep the world going and to keep the economy moving. And um, I think one of the reasons we haven't suffered more damage and more people have not been hurt in, in my region here in the United States is because the government provided a universal basic income. They didn't call it that, by the way. They didn't. They didn't go into that territory because, you know, in our in our country, our politics are like, you know, two football teams. It's like you're either on one team or the other, and you have to like decide what team you're on. I, I never can really understand that. I like to say I'm not on either one team. I'm, you know, I'm I'm on the I'm I'm on, you know, I'm a, I'm an American. I'm not on one of these two sports teams. So, I think that you know we have a situation right now where this UBI concept is probably more important than ever. And if you talk to a lot of visionaries around this area, like Guy Standing and others, they're probably surprised to see large scale tests now underway. Up to this point, there are relatively small scale tests going on in UBI. But I think now we've seen there are certainly moments in time when this is critical. Will it be persistent You know, from this point forward? I think that that's still yet to be seen. Mark, I know we have so many questions and I know we have limits to your time, but this is a, a last question for, I, I, for, for anybody who's ever been at Dreamforce, and this is somebody who's been at Dreamforce, where you essentially have set a global standard for in-person engagement and connecting with customers. Uh, and it's also, as they say, it's not kind of spectacular. The question is, it's truly spectacular, but how do you plan to replace that experience? And for anybody who didn't go before, I had the privilege of going, and it's truly a, a, a spectacle to see and it's not only to watch your technological abilities, but more importantly, your marketing abilities. Anybody who wants to learn about marketing need to go to one of those events. Well, I'm so glad you asked me that question. And I'll tell you that I think that one of the things is for us, you know, we realize there's not too many Dreamforce this year. I even had a CEO of a large hotel company email me, Mark, you know, you can't cancel Dreamforce. Well, you just can't do it. And I'm like, well, then you explain to me how I'm supposed to have a 150,000 event with 3,000 breakout sessions, each with more than 200 people each, you know, during the middle of a pandemic. It's not going to happen, you know. So I think that still for a lot of us, we want to hold on to the past that there's going to be a dream force this year. Like, no, there's not going to be a dream force in November 2020. But look at what Salesforce is doing already. We're doing a lot of virtual programs, like I mentioned we're already doing about one or two major virtual programs every week. In fact, last Thursday, I did a program with Anil Bushri as the CEO of Workday. And we did a program. You can see it's on Twitter. It's on my Twitter feed. Well, you'll notice about 9 million people attended the program. And it included a discussion with Anil. It included a demonstration of new technology we're doing. And we had an amazing uh, presentation and musical performance by Leon Bridges, a phenomenal musician. And it was incredible. Now, it's not Dreamforce, okay? But it's that type of experience virtually. And I think each one of us has to kind of find our digital analogs. If we're in an all-digital environment, Dreamforce has to transform to be all digital. If we're in a work-anywhere environment, then Dreamforce has to transform to be a work-anywhere environment. And that's true for the IDB. That's true for Salesforce. That's true for all, every company on this call. That's true for every individual on the call. We need to transform. We need to change. We need to evolve. We need to move forward. We need to look inside ourselves and listen to our own hearts and say, okay, I realize the past is gone. Now the future is ahead of me. 
what am I going to do right now? What do I really want? You know, sometimes maybe it's what do I really need? Maybe it's not about what I want. Maybe it's like what I need right now. But what is your desire? How are you moving forward? Where are you going? What is important to you? What are the values that are going to guide you forward? This is where we need to spend time. I know this is what I'm do what I do. Like when I was on with my management team yesterday, I went through and I said, you know, do we are we out of paralysis and into participation? Is our productivity back? You know, because we and we start reviewing all the things we're doing that we think that are important, focusing on mental health, over communicating, building new products, being relevant with our customers, you know, being supportive of our community, making sure that we're there supporting the recovery and helping, whether it's PPE or supporting our hospitals or whatever our role can be in the pandemic. I mean, sometimes I can't tell you how many masks we've provided others. In fact, everywhere I've gone, I've tried to deliver masks because. I think masks are probably the one tool we have in our tool chest to actually stop and lower the spread. That if we could somehow normalize masks so that even just wearing, you know, a basic cloth mask, you know, just something very basic like this reduces 90% of those droplets that spread the virus. So it's so important to everyone to wear masks and um, you know we'll have a reduction in the spread of the virus but we have to normalize it because I think you know even here you know where I am masks have become politicized which I think is so sad because that's our only tool in our tool chest that we knew we don't have any major therapeutics we don't have any kind of magic bullet to stop the spread we know that so we need to have social distancing. We know we need masks, but masks we know, if you go into a grocery store and you're wearing a mask and you're coming out, you're gonna be all right. That's just the science. And outside is actually also, you're gonna probably be fine. So I always say to people, outside is probably the new inside. I've been invited to a number of outside conferences, you know, where CEOs are getting together 20 in a circle sitting outside in a grass field talking because they feel that they're safe. Probably they are based on what the research that I've read. It's kind of an unusual situation. I never thought I'd be in a grass field with 20 CEOs in a circle, you know, talking about business, but that's our new world we're in. So we need to like, think about what are all the new things and then how do we move forward? So yes, we're going to have Dreamforce, but it's going to be digital Dreamforce. It'll be virtual. Millions of people will attend it, not even just a hundred thousand, you know, and it'll be all year long. And we're gonna be doing, you know, we have multiple conferences happening every week. You know, by the time we're done, I wanna have millions of dream forces have already happened. Because look, physical events, that's not happening. But digital, well, we're gonna, this is not gonna be our last conversation together, President Moreno, you know that. You know, this is just our first digital conversation. Before this, we've had hundreds of in-person conversations and meetings, and we've sitting around in groups, and we're having a cup of coffee, or we're having a whatever, we're there, all kinds of different places all over the world. Well, that's not happening right now. So that's where we have to reconceptualize. Who are we? What is our role in this world? How do we move things forward? How do we improve the state of the world? How do we improve ourselves? How do we get ourselves from paralysis into participation? And let's take care of our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health, our emotional health, our families. Let's take everyone, everyone with us into the future. That's the message. And if their spiritual message is that we can actually improve the world and here's some things we can do, let's make sure we take the spiritual message with us. Let's hear the spiritual message and take it with us and, and integrate that now into our life. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation as always, Mark. You always are full of energy, of ideas, and it's been a, a, a and even in this digital way, you still manage to communicate all that passion inside of you to really, truly improve the, 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 the state of the world. And, and it's fascinating to watch all the things you're doing. We'll stay in close contact. And I really, really want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this wonderful conversation. Well, I want to thank you, President Moreno, because you're one of my inspirations and everything that you've done with the IDB to improve lives, everything the IDB has done in the Latin American region, how you've introduced me to so many Latin American leaders, 
how I've seen so many amazing things that, that I would have never have seen. And I just want to thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. And thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye and best wishes. Bye. Thank you.